Hello all, I'm Fadila Shaib, uh, talking to you from WHO uh, headquarters in Geneva. Um, I would like to uh, welcome you to our virtual press uh, conference today, Wednesday uh, 3rd of April, on global and humanitarian issues. Let me introduce to you a participant in the room. We have Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, WHO Director General, Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director of WHO uh, Emergencies Program. Uh, we have also Dr. Jawad Mahjour, Head of the WHO Secretariat to INB and AHR Amendment. And we have also the pleasure to welcome uh, Nikanin Ritaroli Polina, Senior Technical Lead on Human Rights, um, to talk about World Health Day. We have also with us Dr. Rick Pieperkorn online from Jerusalem. He's the WHO representative for the occupied Palestinian territory. We have a number of other WHO experts that I will be introducing if the, there is a need for them to speak to you. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks. Dr. Tedros, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you, Fadila. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. First, to Gaza. WHO is horrified by the killing of seven humanitarian workers from World Central Kitchen in Gaza on Monday. The work they were doing was saving lives, providing food to thousands of starving people. Their cars were clearly marked and should never have been attacked. Delivering humanitarian aid in Gaza is already difficult and dangerous. Hungry people will go unfed because World Central Kitchen has quite understandably posed its operations. I honor our colleagues for their service and for putting themselves in harm's way to serve others. WHO has been working with World Central Kitchen in Gaza to deliver food to health workers and patients in hospitals. This horrific incident highlights the extreme danger under which WHO colleagues and our partners are working and will continue to work. But we can only do so with safe access. This means an effective and transparent mechanism for the confliction must be put in place to ensure humanitarian convoys can move safely. We need more entry points, including in northern Gaza, cleared roads, and predictable and expedited passage through checkpoints. Delays and denials of humanitarian missions not only prevent us from reaching those in need, but also impact other operations and deliveries by diverting scarce resources. In addition to the attack on World Central Kitchen convoy, we're likewise appalled that Al-Shifa Hospital has been put out of action and that much of it has been badly damaged or destroyed. Over the last few days, WHO's team in Gaza has been seeking permission to access what is left of the hospital to speak with staff and to see what can be saved. But at the moment, the situation looks disastrous. Al-Shifa was the largest hospital and main referral center in the Gaza Strip, with 750 beds, 26 operating rooms, 32 intensive care rooms, a dialysis department, and a central laboratory. I repeat, hospitals must be respected and protected. They must not be used as battlefields. Since the conflict began, WHO has verified 906 attacks on healthcare in Gaza, the West Bank, Israel, and Lebanon, resulting in 736 deaths and 1,014 injuries. Only 10 of Gaza's 36 hospitals are still able to function even partially. WHO will continue to support those hospitals to deliver services as best they can. 
More than 33,000 people have now been killed in Gaza and almost 80,000 injured. We're seeing a very high burden of respiratory and skin infections and diarrheal illness. This Sunday marks six months since the conflict began. WHO welcomes last week's UN Security Council resolution demanding a ceasefire and we call for its immediate implementation. Once again, we call for all hostages to be released and for lasting peace. Now to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which is experiencing a severe outbreak of MPOX. More than 4,500 suspected cases and almost 300 deaths have been reported so far this year, triple the numbers of cases and deaths reported in the first quarter of last year. 19 of DRC's 26 provinces have reported cases and 70% of cases and 87% of deaths are in children under 15 years of age. While Mpox is spread among children by close contact, there is also a concerning outbreak among adults due to sexual transmission in previously unaffected areas. These outbreaks are being caused by clade 1 of the virus that causes Mpox, which has been present in DRC for decades and can cause higher mortality than the clade 2 virus that spread globally in 2022. WHO and our partners, including Africa CDC, are supporting the Ministry of Health to respond to the outbreak and to assess Mpox vaccines. However, additional funding is needed to expand and sustain the response and ensure the virus does not spread to neighboring countries. WHO has called consistently for more attention to better understand and stop Mpox transmission in Africa and to improve clinical care and access to vaccines. At its meeting last month, WHO Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on Immunization, SAGE, also issued a call to action to enhance access to Mpox vaccines, to improve regulatory and procurement processes, to ensure research is embedded in emergency vaccine deployment, and to invest in research capacity in Africa. The Mpox outbreak is one of several overlapping crises in the DRC. There are also outbreaks of measles and cholera, severe flooding in more than half of provinces, and since the beginning of this year, more than 350,000 people have been displaced, mostly because of armed conflict. Now to the United States, where the U.S. CDC has confirmed one case of H5N1 avian influenza in a person who works at a commercial dairy farm. The patient did not report any symptoms apart from eye redness, was not hospitalized, and is recovering. Investigations are continuing into how the person was infected, and WHO is in close contact with the U.S. CDC. Any case of H5N1 is concerning because it's highly dangerous to humans, although it has never been shown to be easily transmissible between people. WHO and our partners track influenza viruses globally to monitor the evolution and spread of viruses in both animals and humans. Finally, this Sunday marks World Health Day the 76th anniversary of the Constitution of the World Health Organization coming into force. This year's theme for World Health Day is My Health, My Right, reaffirming what WHO has affirmed since its birth on the 7th of April 1948, that health is a right for all people, not a luxury. In fact, the WHO Constitution was the first instrument of international law 
to affirm that the highest attainable standard of health is a fundamental right of all people without distinction. Today, at least 140 countries recognize the right to health in their own constitutions. And yet, around the world, that right is often unrealized or under threat. At least 4.5 billion people, more than half of the world's population, are not fully covered by essential health services. And 2 billion people face financial hardship due to out-of-pocket health spending. Outbreaks, disasters, conflict, and climate change are all causing death and disability, hunger, and psychological distress. Realizing the right to health means passing and implementing laws to ensure people can access the health services they need, where and when they need them, without financial hardship. It means addressing the reasons people get sick and die. It means safe drinking water, clean air, and good nutrition. It means quality housing and decent working and environmental conditions. And it means freedom from discrimination. 76 years since our founding, WHO remains totally committed to the highest attainable standard of health as a fundamental right for all people everywhere. This World Health Day, we call on all people to demand your health as your right. Della, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. I will now open the floor for questions from journalists. Uh, if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand using the raise your hand icon and unmute yourself. We will start with Helen Branswell, Stat. Helen, can you hear me? Yes, thank you very much, Fidela. Um, I, my question is about the H5 case in, um, in the United States. I believe the last risk assessment that WHO conducted on H5, particularly the 3.4.4B clade viruses, was published in late uh, 2022. Is WHO going to undertake an updated uh, risk assessment of that clade of viruses, please? Thanks. Thank you, Helen. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Josh Mott, Senior Advisor, Influenza and Pandemic Preparedness, to uh, answer your question. Uh, Dr. Mott, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you, Helen, for the good question. Um, you know, currently it is the 2.3.4.4B virus that is spreading globally. As you know, it emerged in 2020 and spread globally um, as a virus in, in many animals, but then it spread to um, uh, uh, aquatic and terrestrial mammals um, as it spread, including in the United States. That virus has infected um, cats and dogs and other mammals, and now more recently, cattle and goats as well. And as you know, the recent case um, has been associated with um, infection in livestock and um, uh, conjunctivitis in a dairy worker. What we know so far is that um, the virus itself has not changed substantially from that which we have seen um, spreading globally. We do know that that virus has been adapted to mammalian hosts in some capacity, but has not shown any signs of spreading efficiently in, uh, uh, from human to human. Um, and so for that reason, at this point, we have not seen a change in the virus. We'll continue to stay in close contact with the WHO Collaborating Center for Influenza at CDC and with our colleagues at the um, Regional Office for the Americas at PAHO um, to continue to assess the situation. The investigation's ongoing. We're looking at the changing epidemiology um, and make decisions as we go. Uh, some things that we're doing to be prepared, of course, though, are the current to look at the current candidate vaccine viruses for H5 in case it were to spread in humans, do the current viruses that we have, would they work for a pandemic vaccine? And we can say that right now for this virus, they currently would, and it responds to antivirals as well. Um, that on top of making sure that surveillance is as good as it can be globally is what we're doing while we assess the situation and then determine any future need for more risk assessments. 
Thank you uh, so much, Dr. Mott. I would like now to invite Belissa uh, Godino, W Magazine, to ask the next question. Belinda, can you hear me? Hi, thank you for taking my question. I'm Belisa Godino from W Magazine, based in Portugal, of, of Global Broadcast. My question is, how is emergency medical assistance in the conflict between Ukraine and Rus Russia going? Anything new to highlight? Are human rights being assured? Thank you. Thank you, um, Mike. Yeah. Mike, Ryan will take your question. Thank you. Um, yeah, we continue. The, the Ukraine remains one of our, our largest operations uh, uh, in, in the world, uh, and uh, along with uh, our operations in, 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 in Gaza and in other places around the world. Um, the, um, we're working very, very closely with the Ukrainian health authorities to ensure that the health system can emerge uh, and be strengthened out of uh, this three years of nearly three years of war right now. There has been deterioration of the health system. There has been degradation of the health infrastructure. Um, and we still require uh, all parties in the conflict to provide unhindered humanitarian access, in, in particular in areas close to the front line uh, and to those under temporary military control. Um, we need to be able to meet people's needs in those uh, conflict zones. But the whole health system across Ukraine has been put under pressure. It's remarkable uh, to have seen how resilient that system is, to how resilient health workers are. Uh, but the prolonged war continues to bring new challenges and it tests, continually tests the system's capacity to respond. Um, insecurity and access challenges uh, are continuing to hamper assistance in areas under military control, as I said before. Uh, and our assessment, the current assessment, um, remains the same. Uh, uh, about 40% of the population of Ukraine still require some form of humanitarian assistance. The 13.6 million displaced people, uh, displaced Ukrainians, 6.4 million um, individual refugees have been recorded globally. Um, so. There is still a huge displacement phenomenon. There are still many, many Ukrainians displaced outside the country as refugees, as I said. Um, and uh, when we've done needs assessments on the front lines, uh, it's very, very clear that a large proportion of people um, uh, lacked primary health care access. People with chronic conditions and children are facing problems in accessing health care. Attacks on health care have been the highest we've recorded in, in any particular conflict. Uh, we've verified a total of 1,682 attacks on health care uh, since the beginning of the war. Uh, 1,461 of those affected health care facilities and 384 uh, impacted health supplies. Um, uh, we continue to monitor the situation at the Zaporizhia uh, nuclear power plant, uh, and we have uh, uh, an emergency appeal out there for 112 million US dollars to cover the requirements uh, for um, for um, healthcare support to the population of Ukraine through the Ministry of Health. So. Uh, Testament to our, our team on the ground, to our partners in the health cluster, to our partners in the emergency medical teams, uh, and to those who funded this response. Uh, so the needs are still great. Uh, the health system is exceptionally fragile. The health workers continue to make this system work, and WHO and its partners continue to support those health workers and that is the health system on the ground. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ryan. Uh, I believe uh, Dr. Zakaria Teresa would like to add uh, some details. Uh, Dr. Uh, Zakaria, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Fadila. Um, uh, on Ukraine, yes, um, just to also build on uh, what uh, Mike has mentioned, um, this is one of the emergencies where WHO has actually managed to leverage uh, the strength of uh, our na the national partners, so national organizations inside Ukraine, to scale up the, the provision of uh, emergency health services to the population uh, in need of such services. Uh, in this year, uh, WHO is helping to coordinate 91 health cluster partners. The majority of them are national partners, and they also include national EMTs. This is a, um, a good practice uh, that we're also trying 
to uh, replicate to the extent possible uh, in other settings, uh, including in um, Palestine, uh, where national capacities exist and they can continue to be built up so that national emergency medical teams can be as performant um, and um, uh, considering their um, advantage as well in terms of familiarity with the populations um, uh, and the context. Um, so, um, uh, so I, I think I would also like to highlight here that uh, Ukraine, as Mike mentioned, um, has still a tremendous health needs. Uh, the health system remains resilient, but requires help. And the more, uh, the longer it is under pressure, uh, then the more eroded its coping capacities uh, become. Um, Ukraine is uh, at the uh, at the moment funded at twenty four percent of the uh, financial requirements, um, and it's it's really far from um, uh, what we need to properly respond to the need of of the populations. Uh, but uh, this is also to highlight that um, unfortunately across the world, uh, this is what we are seeing: uh, less and less financing to respond to the urgent health needs of so many millions of people affected by various humanitarian emergencies. Thank you, and back to you, Fadel. Thank you. Uh, I would like now to invite uh, Mohamed Arslan from Anadolu to uh, ask the next question. Mohamed? Yes, uh, thank you, Fadila. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, there is an uh, unsafe uh, environment for uh, healthcare workers in Gaza right now. Uh, my question is, uh, how many stars uh, how many staff WHO uh, does have there now? And uh, does WHO have safety concern uh, for its staff? Uh, and the last question is, have you considered uh, any measure to ensure that your service will continue to reach Gazan people? Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. I would like to invite uh, Rick Pipperkorn, Dr. Rick Pipperkorn, WHO representative, to, to take these two questions. Uh, Dr. Pipperkorn, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, and good afternoon to, to all. I think that the question is twofold. So first of all, yeah, we have a very strong team in Gaza with approximately uh, seven internationals and currently like 16, 17 national staff operating we are there to stay and deliver as good as possible we are actually recruiting more staff probably at the moment we actually have 20 national staff because we're recruiting uh, more staff some of our staff are now also gaza uh, uh, gaza staff are now based in cairo and assisting us uh, as well we are there of course to to stay and deliver now you mentioned something about the security and 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 security concerns. And I think the, uh, the DG, I think, rightly highlights uh, why we are all appalled by the killing of the, the seven WOCK uh, humanitarian workers, our colleagues, in clearly marked vehicles. It actually, in an, I know that area very well, in actually in a deconflicted area. So what it shows that a deconfliction mechanism is not working and maybe i want to say something about that so the un and partners when you need to you need to be able to deliberate throughout gaza so what you what, what is needed is an effective transparent and workable deconfliction and notification mechanism so you has to be assured that convoys and facilities are not targeted it means that ensuring movement of aid within Gaza, including through checkpoints. It's that it is predictable, expedited, etc. Roads are operational, that that roads are cleared, etc. Now we just to, to repeat when when we uh, the DG also reflected on Shipa. So since the uh, last siege in uh, on Sipa, that was a couple of weeks ago, the WHO organized six missions, six missions to do three tasks, to make a quick assessment, discuss with the staff, make a quick assessment, and to assist the patients to being referred from Shiva to al Ahdi hospital and staff, and to make sure that the patients in critical conditions, the few or triage would be done, and to take them to the south of Gaza. Six times those missions were denied 
impedes or delays. And so it's it's not functional. And even today, today the WHL, my team, was in a mission to the north again to deliver fuel and medical supplies, food and water to Al Ahli Hospital and Sahaba Hospital in the north and to help with referral from some, some patients. They were, as was planned and agreed on, between six and seven, ready to go. They went to the checkpoint just before the checkpoint. They've been waiting and waiting and waiting up till now. Now they had to return back. As we speak, they're returning back to their to their guest houses. So again, we see way too many missions, impedes, delays, or denied. And and it's not only about these missions, a whole day in that AV, etc. And uh, but it's also making the missions which are delays, and I've been on quite a few myself, they're becoming more arduous and dangerous. You sometimes return 11 o'clock at night or, or midnight or even past midnight. So it becomes unnecessary dangerous. And I want to say about something about that too. This is not the first time this horrific attack on WCK. We shouldn't forget that already in December, January, we have seen, <clears throat> unfortunately, uh, attacks and sometimes a shooting at UN vehicles. Uh, and and including, I, I remember I was in a mission myself in early December to the north to Al Ahli. And there was an, 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 an air drive just 150 meters from our car. The, the truck delivering medical supplies was shot at. The PCS people were shot at, and PCS staff were actually uh, arrested and detained for a while. So all of that makes, of course, a an, humanitarian an operation extremely uh, difficult. And, and this is what we expect, a functional and a workable deconfliction uh, mechanism. And that means a mechanism all over Gaza and not just to the north, for all over Gaza. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Pieper Korn. I would like now to call on uh, Robin Millar from IFP to ask the next question. Robin? Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask a question on the pandemic accord negotiations. Uh, countries failed to reach an agreement uh, on time before Easter and are going to come back at the end of April for more talks. So in the time between now and then, what do you want to see countries do in order to try and bridge those gaps that still remain. Thank you. Was it clear? Should I have said something about Chief and Ask Richard to mute. Dr. Peppercorn, can you unmute yourself, please? Mute. Mute. <laughs> mute yourself, please. It's done. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I think uh, the. Uh, the negotiations that start a few months ago is continuing. I don't think that what's happened last INB could be qualified as failure, but this is a continued process that uh, member states uh, are taking to negotiate and to come up to consensus. What the INB uh, asked for is uh, they mandated the Bureau of uh, the INB to come up with new iterations uh, to, uh, for uh, discussion and negotiation in uh, next uh, INB on 29th of April. But also they asked the, the Bureau to organize uh, several informal meetings before that, before, uh, before sharing the, 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 the uh, text and also after sharing the text. And the, the Bureau is uh, planning and organizing several informal meetings with key proponents of the negotiation, but also with the regional uh, groups and also with ambassador in Geneva. The aim is uh, to seek advice from member state on what are the key issues that need to be reflected in the new iteration, but also what are the areas where there is a potential uh, uh, agreement or the, what are the areas where we need more work. And this uh, preparatory meeting that the Bureau is planning will be extremely helpful uh, in first coming up with the new draft that is uh, an, a good step forward to reach in consensus, but also uh, to seek the advice from uh, 
the member state on issues that would like to see in this text. I think we are very hopeful and we are uh, uh, optimistic that in the next meeting uh, the member state will get uh, there. Uh, I think the only challenge that they have now is the uh, how to deal with this great big amount of details that there are in the in the compilation text that reflects all member states input but I think uh, the bureau is working on that to come up with more streamlined version uh, that concentrated key issues and also uh, <clears throat> the most important things to come up uh, uh, to discuss now I agree on now and maybe uh, reflect on issues that need further work after the deadline of May 24. Dr. Tedros? Yeah, thank you. Uh, on the pandemic agreement uh, negotiation, uh, one, there is progress uh, already made until the last meeting. And second, uh, there is commitment by member states uh, to have a deal by May 2024. And third, um, they know their respective positions now with the remaining uh, issues uh, which, where they have not uh, reached um, a consensus. And that means I think by the time they come back, they will be ready to give, to give and, 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 and take. So considering all these three, our understanding is, as uh, Dr. Mahjur said, uh, there, there, there could be a deal. That's what we, we expect. Uh, given the current situation. I have, I have tried to participate or to attend many of the meetings in the last round of uh, negotiation, I MB9, and what I have seen is encouraging, and uh, I hope they will reach a deal uh, there by May 2024. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. I would like now to call on Abdul, a reporter for The Guardian. Abdul, can you hear me? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, please go Thank ahead. Thank you. Sorry, it's Geneva Abdul from The Guardian. Um, I just have a question with regards to the comment that was made that the current deconfliction mechanism is not working. Um, what are the repercussions to the WHO foresees that will result from this, both for medical workers in Gaza, um, but also those in need of aid? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I believe we have, we still have uh, Dr. Pipercorn. Dr. Pipercorn, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I will try to. So I think it's, I try to, to be clear on that. And, and a good deconfliction uh, system is that you agree that the UN, I'm talking now for the UN and partners, that you agree, first of all, we prepare a mission every time in Gaza, whatever mission it is, food delivery, if it is uh, medical supplies, it's, it doesn't matter if it is WHO, WFP or UNICEF, you prepare a mission, which is a lot of work. And all the details, all the details are, are shared through our counterpart or Israeli counterparts. The timing, where to, et cetera, including the people on the missions, et cetera, all the staff, et cetera, is done. Then there's an agreement, there's an agreement, there's a green light that, okay, that mission can take place from this hour. Now, you want to start as early as possible, and for some of the food transport, my colleagues in WP can be clear, it's even better to do that in at night, actually before, before the sunrise. But I say with medical supplies, etc., fuel, what we do, medical supplies, uh, fuel, food for patients, uh, etc. We normally start a mission around, uh, we get out around 5, 6 in the morning, 6 o'clock. And we should start at 6 o'clock because the, there will be always delays and you want to be back in daylight. That's one. So there's an agreement then that you report and you will get a green light again around 6.30, 7 o'clock. That's where it starts. Then at the, normally there's a holding point at the checkpoints, the military checkpoints, you have to wait. Again, discussions, etc. Normally, in, I had a few smooth missions, but most of the missions were always problems. There were always delays, 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 and, and often deny, denials in the end, or even, or even before 
that we submitted the mission and it was denied for very often completely unclear reasons. But if you've agreed, you stick to it. And, and what I said, uh, the mission of today is a good example to bring fuel, medical supplies, food and water to those two hospitals in the north. It was all agreed that they would leave 6.30, 7 o'clock. Then first of all, they don't get a green light to go. Then finally, they get a green light to go to the, to the checkpoint. They go to the checkpoint, and with food, it's always risky. I'm going to say all those, all those uh, missions are, have their risk as well, with so many people desperate. Then they have to wait before the checkpoints, and they wait, and they wait, and they wait. In the meantime, very little discussion, not, nothing is going on, etc. And at one stage, so they already realized if we get the green light now, we cannot go to Sahaba anymore. They already may change their plans. They would only deliver the supplies to uh, to to Alahi Hospital and then go back. But now it took so much time, and finally it's, it's it goes over, so they will never be able to return. And they have to cancel the mission. So what, of course, what is a workable deconfliction uh, mechanism that routes are coordinated, cleared, that, um, that we also, that it's predictable, uh, a predictable mechanism, and, and that we ensure that, uh, that also the roads are cleared, which are going to be taken, and that there's multiple entry. And it is not so difficult. I mean, anyone who knows Gaza, there's a number of roads which can be easily cleared and made operational. And, and there, should be, there should be 15 missions going to the north every day. Multiple food, water, shelter missions should be going and maybe one uh, medical uh, mission every day. That should be happening, including everywhere in the, in the south. It also will mean, means roads should be cleared and, 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 and unexploded uh, ordinance should be, um, should be uh, removed. And these missions are also complex because also from the UN, you need to have a security officer with you, which are often rare, et cetera. You, need, you would like to have even somebody who recognizes unexploded uh, ordinances uh, with you in the team, and then, of course, your team lead. Now, it's, it's an enormous amount of work, and every mission which gets delayed or impeded or denied means, and I think the DG was pointing that out, that other missions cannot take place. So that we cannot do other uh, uh, priorities. So in a way, it's a simple mechanism. And somehow it has never properly worked. It's yes, we have had many missions, but it's never met and properly worked. And in, uh, we have, I think, on this former press conferences in January and, 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 and February, we, we, I think we made a point that from the 20 missions we actually asked for the North, I think something like 14 or 15 were denied, impeded, not happening. That should not happen. Those missions, and even, I want to make the point, even if there's an active conflict going on, then you expect that humanitarian corridors are created. Humanitarian corridors where, where uh, the humanitarian part, the UN and partners can safely deliver their aid and do their job make your assessment, deliver it, and come back in time. And clearly, uh, the, the horrific um, attack on WCK is clearly a sign that it, it was, of course, absolutely not working. And I just wanted to make the point that we have had incidents in the past, and the UN has repeatedly reported on those, uh, those incidents. Should not happen, so I really do expect whatever comes out now, that we get a functional deconfliction, a deconfliction uh, mechanism and a proper notification system, and that the UN and partners can do their work. And I just want to say that we are here, and we are here to stay and to deliver. Maybe on one last point I want to make, because it's close to my heart, and the DG was referring to, to Shiba, Al Shiba Hospital, and currently, as we've all seen, non-functional. And indeed, the, for anyone who knows it, it was the beating heart of, of the Gaza health system. I mean, we talked about 17,000 operations annually, 750 beds. 
I mean, a dial dialysis department with a capacity of 52 beds, a central lab for the Ministry of Health. But even maybe more important, it was also a teaching hospital. Hundreds, thousands of, of young student doctors, nurses, midwives, etc., lab technicians, residents, etc., were, were taught there and got their training. And this hospital not being functional, and, and the other, the second largest referral hospital in Gaza, the National Medical Complex in Khan Yunus, at the moment also not functional. We've reported on the missions there. I just want to stress that point. So we, WHO, we will help to make this key health for institutions functional again, because it's needed. It's those two institutions are absolutely needed in Gaza, and we will make that happen too in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Piper Court, Dr. Mike Ryan. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I just want to speak to this because <clears throat> there's maybe an impression that this deconfliction thing is something that's just started in this conflict and it's not working because it's new to us. We've been doing this for decades. Uh, and you ask, you know, humanitarians and military uh, militaries aren't necessarily uh, have the same objective. What you need in order to have deconfliction is that the military and the humanitarians do have the same objective. We have different objectives, but we have one common objective in a normal situation where people are abiding by international humanitarian law, that the humanitarians and the military authorities are both um, um, occupied with the protection of civilians and the insurance of continued humanitarian assistance despite the conflict. I won't say whether a conflict is justified, not justified, right or wrong. The issue is that a responsible military operation will always seek to, to protect civilians and ensure that they have access to the basic necessities of life. Shelter, food, water and medicine. That's why we can work with military authorities, and sometimes uh, 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 not formal military, sometimes anti-government elements, uh, uh, and sometimes uh, organizations that don't have tremendously rigid or strong military structures, because we agree on that principle. And when we agree on that principle, we as humanitarians can disclose very sensitive information to those militaries. We can tell them who that we are, where we are, where we're going, what we're taking, how long we will be, so that they can use their military tactics to avoid attacking us so we can serve the people. That is a common objective of a responsible military acting responsibly in a conflict for which they believe they have a justification to carry out. That is not my choice to make. But it is the responsibility of all combatants in a military conflict to abide by the international humanitarian law, which is to allow access for humanitarians to the population who are at risk, and to ensure that the access for those humanitarians is planned, guaranteed, and supported. That's international humanitarian law. That is the expectation. And deconfliction works when both parties, the humanitarians and the military, observe and are obsessed with that same objective, to ensure that the civilian population Receive the, receive the care that they need. And in that sense, we, as humanitarians, disclose a lot of information because telling someone where you are in a conflict puts you at risk. Telling someone what road you're using puts you potentially at risk. We do that in order so the military know where we are, that they, we can't assume all the time that the military will know where everyone is. We want to avoid accidents. We want to avoid any problems by, by letting them know. And uh, Rick outlined that process day to day. There's a huge overhead in doing that, because it's exhausting to do that every day. And to be able to, and the problem is, and we've said this way even before January, Rick, you were saying January, back last year, in November, WHO was clearly stating that the deconfliction system wasn't working. We were telling the world that it wasn't working. It's clearly not working. And our staff and our partners are in danger because of it. And something needs to be done to ensure. We would like, as Tedra said, the conflict must end. Hostages must be released. We need peace. In the absence of that peace, we need deconfliction and we need humanitarian access and we need humanitarian corridors. And in protecting those <clears throat> health workers by providing them with medicine, and uh, Rick spoke to that in his, uh, in his intervention, uh, I'd just like to link the two ideas. We have the treaty or the accord or the agreement coming up, which at its heart is about protecting populations, but within that protecting health workers. And now we have a problem uh, in, in conflict where it's difficult to protect health workers. 
uh, I, at the at the consultation between uh, the the um, the bureau of the IMB and civil society and, and non governmental organisations, Pedro Villardi from Public Services International spoke eloquently about the need for this agreement in order to provide the basis of protection for our health workers who suffered so much, sacrificed so much, gave so much their lives in the face of COVID. They're doing the same thing in Gaza. Our health workers are offering up their very lives to support the populations they serve. Both our health workers and the agreement of, of an accord and the health workers who serve in Gaza deserve our protection, our collective protection under international law, be that in an international agreement for the next pandemic, or be it through the proper application of international humanitarian law, which already exists. So we call out to all the member states, please ensure that IHL is respected and that deconfliction measures are demanded by the international community, especially now in the case of Gaza. Uh, thank you. I would like now to invite Gabriel Tetro-Farber from uh, Reuters to ask the next question. Gabriel? Uh, thank you, Fadela. Um, I'd like to ask about Al-Shifa, if possible. Um, it's been described as the heart of the health system in Gaza. And for months, we've been saying that Gaza couldn't afford to lose another health facility. Uh, what happens now when you, you lose such a massive referral center? Um, and, and what are the odds you think you have to, to get that mission authorized from the Israeli authorities in terms of uh, making an assessment of what can be done for the remaining patients on the ground. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Dr. Pieperkorn? Yes, yeah, thank you. It's a, it's a very, uh, very false question. Uh, well, first of all, I think, uh, yeah, we, uh, we definitely uh, need a Shifa or what I say, NASA medical complex. And I think we all will realize that the current healthcare providers is insufficient and absolutely not of the, the quality uh, you would like to offer to anyone around the world. Also realizing that, that Gaza had a relatively, I wouldn't say fantastic, but okay functional health system before this crisis. And, and again, producing health indicators at par with, uh, with its neighboring uh, countries. And yes, struggled somewhere in quality, primary health care, mental health, et cetera. And some of the, with no proper oncology, we, WHO, we wanted to assist with actually setting up a cancer hospital in Gaza. As a, but overall, it was working well. So there is this, this huge group of very well-trained health workers, which, we estimate probably a quarter, a third, maybe a little more, a little less, are still operational. So you ask where. So what currently what is done is a little bit what is done, I think, in every crisis of war. So which hospitals are still operational? And we have seen this over the last six months. That, for example, when you look at the, at the north, we have hospitals like Shiba, which was non-functional at one stage. And then it became functional again with a lot of support from WHO and partners. It again became functional and not as a third level hospital, but definitely as a first level hospital. Actually, when we talked about a couple of weeks ago, six, seven weeks ago, and I was again in Gaza, then Shiva was still again a little bit. We were, uh, it was still the, again the referral point for trauma cases in the north. Now, that's now again lost. Yeah, maybe I'm too hopeful, but I also always think we we should look at the possibility to to have a um, at least a functional unit there, and definitely trauma support units, uh, primary healthcare unit, and look what is possible. But you need access for that. There's other hospitals in the north which have had different. We talked about Kamal at one. We talked about Al Ahli. Al Ahli was a relatively small hospital and became relevant because other hospitals became partly functional, non-functional, barely functional, etc. And Al Ahli, but also Al Ahli, when I was there early December, was completely overloaded. And then actually late December, it was non-functional. At once it was 
was besieged, health workers left, etc. Health workers came back, etc. And we we it's now again uh, partly functional. And WHO and parts we help Al Ahly Hospital. So we will have to do we Gaza will have to do with a number of of hospitals in the north. Now in our discussions with our Israeli counterpart, they have informed us they want functional health in the north. So we will push that agenda. And again, we have been able to sometimes bring supplies when we have reported on the many, many missions we did. We want to do much more. And we don't want a mission like today to be canceled or delayed or impeded and not happening. So yeah, we will have to work with a number of these facilities and see what we done. That also applies for the south, where we shoot at south of Wadi Gaza, where approximately 1.9 from the 2.3 million people who reside. That's, equal, that's even more important now, like which are the hospitals which are functional, and then losing Nasser Medical Complex is of course a huge blow, a huge blow. It means much more work for the European Gaza um, Hospital, which is completely overwhelmed, and Al-Aqsa Hospital, which are now the two referral hospitals. And a hospital in Rafa itself, Al Najjar, which used to be not a referral hospital, but is currently operating as a um, referral hospital. There are a few field hospitals, which is IMC, I think, which is doing a fantastic job as well, and, and, and even taking some of the referral cases. But even then, even IMC relies uh, on, for example, European Gaza to hospital to refer patients to more complex patients, and, 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 and they don't have all the medical equipment uh, for that. So it's, it's really, and I would say it's a, it's a complex, but I'd say overall, we have to, to recognize that absolutely insufficient health care is provided in Gaza. It's a health system on its knees, that we said so often, and it is. It's, it's insufficient, it's incomplete. The WHO part, we're also trying to help the primary health care system to revive that. UNRWA, I want to mention UNRWA there is doing a fantastic job in, in and actually making sure that their primary healthcare clinics are continuously open. And, and we are also happily supporting and working with that. So we've always made the point that we we want to expand the, 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 current, uh, the current system, uh, the current system uh, and expand it with emerging medical teams. There's a number of emerging medical teams operational and in specifically South of Wadi Gaza. We were bringing the first, uh, we we're planning to bring in the first um, emergency medical team in the north, in Al Ahli Hospital. That has happened. We had plans, of course. If you would ask me that six weeks ago, we were planning to, when we were reviving, helping to revive Shipa, to also to, to get an emergency medical team in Shipa. All those things can only work when there is a certain level of security. I mean, of course, we all want a ceasefire with a certain level of security. What I can say now about Shifa, that indeed thousands will be left without healthcare. They will have to move to places in the north, to, 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 to Al Ahli, to Kamal Al Wan, to Al Hilu, which is a very small hospital, which has also struggles to remain open and to, to places like that. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Pieper Kohn. I, uh, we have come to the end of our press uh, briefing. Thank you all for your participation. You will be receiving the video and audio files of this press conference shortly, and the transcript will be available on the WHO website. Uh, and of course, we will be sending you uh, Dr. Tedros' uh, uh, opening uh, remarks. Um, I would like also to let you know that just after uh, the closing by Dr. Tedros, we will have a short video to show about World Health Day. So before we show the video, Dr. Tedros, if you want to close this press briefing. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, uh, thank you. I would like to thank the members of the uh, press for joining us today. Uh, maybe to add a few lines to uh, what Rick had said on uh, Shifa Hospital. I visited Shifa Hospital in 2018. 
Um, even then, um, although the service it was providing was okay, but it had uh, problems and it was uh, serving with its problems and because of the siege even, even then. So what will happen now with uh, Shifa gone, uh, I think as Rick said, many will not be able to access services like what they were getting in Shifa. Uh, but not only that, um, people uh, who need uh, medical evacuation will, will increase. Uh, and medical evacuation is already slow, but, but um, I think the number of uh, people who need will, will, will increase, of course. And with a slow evacuation, meaning, I think you can guess, uh, people will die because they will not get the services either from Shifa or uh, because of slow evacuation because they cannot be uh, evacuated. So that's why um, at least um, the, uh, the process for the evacuation has to, be eva uh, has to be expedited and people who need medical evacuation uh, should be supported elsewhere. Otherwise, we will lose many people. We will lose many lives. Again, to the press group who joined today, thank you uh, so much and uh, see you next time. But please don't go. Uh, we invite you to uh, watch the um, uh, video. Thank you. Her asthma, it's, it's getting worse. We can't help you here. We can't help you now. Come back next week. Can someone please tell me what's going on? You must pay cash to be admitted.